First Hand in the Field, Real Issues, Real Solutions is brought to you by Newport First Hand Jamaica Limited, the first on the land. All right, so it's now time for First Hand in the Field, Real Issues, Real Solutions. And joining us this morning is Melvin Henry, Technical Manager of... Uh, or for Newport for San Jamaica Limited. And last time Melvin was on, he was taking a look at flower and fruit abortion, shedding in agriculture, if you prefer. And so we're going to start things off by having him providing a summary of major points covering during part one of our conversation. And then we're going to be taking a look at uh, some other important issues concerning this topic. Good morning, Melvin, and welcome back to the show. How are you? Good morning, Algie. I'm doing great. Morning to our listeners. Always a pleasure to be on. All right. So, Melvin, can you just provide us with a, a little summary? of the major points covered the, during the part one of this conversation with us? Okay. So we, we took a look at the, the whole issue, which is real, of fruit and the flower um, shedding for abortion, whichever term um, you choose to use. And mainly so because it is one that, as the, the program is dubbed, real issues. And it is indeed a real issue because for most of our farmers, uh, all of our farmers doing um, those crops producing flour, and that's how you get your harvestable um, portion or produce um, to recoup or recover your investment if it is that that flower is not making the transition to a fruit, um, a quality fruit, then it therefore means that you could be at a disadvantage in terms of your yield, the quality of your yield, the quantity of your yield, and until ultimately the revenue that you generated from your crop. So with that said, we looked at some of the major factors or uh, contributing factors to that reality, that issue amongst um, different farmers. And we looked at, for example, environmental factors. And one of them that we paid some amount of attention to was um, insufficient light. Um, flowers and fruits require adequate lighting for development. And it therefore means that if there is um, an undesirable level of shading to the plant, um, then it means that you could very well have an impaired flooring and by extension fruiting, and that would come to bear on how well your revenue stream is based on your yields. Temperature was also looked at because it is well known that the extremes of temperature, so be it um, too low, which will not really experience um, to any significant level in Jamaica. Um, and extremely high temperatures also disrupt flower and fruit development, um, ultimately leading to um, the abortion or the falling of those. So the extreme misses of both temperatures, high or low, normally triggers a stress effect within the plant and part of the plant's natural response to survive is normally to shed those and reallocate um, resources to ensure that it survives that period. So it is in our best interest to ensure that as best as we can, we reduce those stress factors. Um, moisture level was another that we looked at Again, the extremities of moisture within the soil, either being too dry or too wet, is cause for concern. Um, it is well established that water is critical in the transport of the required resources in terms of nutrients to the varying parts of the plant requiring their support. And two of these, of course, are the flowers and the fruits once they are formed. If it is that there's a disruption via drought where there's an inadequate supply, then 
you disrupt the physiological process within the plant, and one of the plant's response is that naturally it's going to shed those. So it's an interruption. The extreme, the other extreme is also um, give you the similar result, where if the moisture level found within the soil, uh, the soil is now oversaturated, blocking out um, hair, what you will tend to see happening is the abortion because again excess moisture in the root zone impedes the uptake of water yes so you will see the normal signs of a wilting plant in drought and if it is that the water resides in the root zone for a protracted period of time you'll see the same wilting of the plant any of those extremities in terms of moisture level within the soil actually impacts the process of flow and food development, and you could have um, serious incidents of flow and food fall. So those, in a nutshell, were the major um, points covered um, in our part one of, of, of this series. Well, thank you very much for that, uh, Melvin. Uh, and of course, uh, pointing to all of the important areas that, to which the farmers need to pay attention. And, and if you're not getting fruit, then you're defeating the purpose of what you're doing because that's why you're farming, to get to have produce that you can sell. So we're very happy to be having this conversation with you. Of course, Melvin, we would have seen and we, we understand that as a result of climate change, we are unfortunately seeing a larger number larger number of pests and diseases that our farmers have to tackle so it begs the question how would you say pests and diseases impact flower and fruit abortion okay um a very good point to note Altia, because um just as severe as those environmental factors mentioned just now pests and diseases have a serious um, role to play as well in influencing the abortion of flowers and fruit. And it is therefore important that as practitioners or farmers pay close attention um, in a proactive manner in ensuring that your fields are not riddled with pests and diseases because they themselves could be the culprits of you having uh, lower than desired yields. So as it relates to the pest and disease, um, there are some insect pests which are referred to as um, herbivorous, meaning that they, they pretty much feed, they eat um, plant parts. And you'd well imagine that the flower being highly nutritious and also tender, and likewise, your developing fruits um, are susceptible, highly susceptible to the being prey on by a lot of our um, insect pests. So, for example, caterpillars, aphids, beetles, and the list goes on. They are attracted to um, these um, plant parts, and as a result of that, once they come in contact and start to um, interfere, with the flower, you will have the plant shedding those flower, and if the fruits are young enough, the plant would recognize as part of its defense mechanism and shed those. So it is in the best interest of um, our farmers to ensure that our pest populations are kept in check, um, and this is normally done through a combination of approaches. So we normally recommend that your first goal should never be um, a chemical approach. And we, we, we speak about an integrated pest management approach. So first off, one of the things that you need to be doing is regular scouting of the field. And the scouting is pretty much to identify those um, pests that are present within the field at a certain threshold. So once they pass a certain threshold, that they can cause economic damage. They are there enough to cause damage, then it's time to hack. But even before we get to that point, there are some practices, cultural practices, that must be adhered to. And one of them that we see... Oh, hold on, Melvin. Don't move to, to the cultural practice. 
this is yet because you're right on the break. So let us just clear commercials and come back. Famto continues here on Power 106 FM, and we're inside the feature first and in the field real issues, real solutions. This morning we have with us Melvin Henry, technical manager, and he is taking a look at flower and fruit abortion. And he was just about to share some of the cultural practices that impact flower and fruit abortion. And farmers, I want you to sit up and pay attention. Melvin? Yes, Alger. So I was uh, about to highlight the fact that there's one practice that is very common um, amongst our farmers that results in insect pests and diseases being transferred from one farm and sometimes across parishes um, due to the, the absence of a particular approach which is considered sown. So one of them is the transfer of planting materials like sweet potato slips, um, dashing suckers from one farm to another, and again I say sometimes from the east to the west, um, without proper due diligence being done at the site of collection. So ideally what should happen, um, let's say you're collecting um, dashing suckers in Westmoreland and you're transferring to St. Catherine, and I'm referring now directly to one in incident that we had to um, deal with in recent past, where the dashing suckers in the parish of origin were loaded with um, uppers, leaf uppers, um, the taro leaf uppers, which is one of the major um, pests within dashing cultivation. And this was just brought across loaded and brought across to St. Catherine. Now, ideally what you want to do is that inspection at the site of collection and treatment if possible. So you dip those planting materials in a recommended um, pesticide solution to ensure that even if they make their way, they, were, they come across to so, um, St. Catherine, they're in a state where they're not able to reproduce or cause any harm. So that is one practice that we'd like to see our farmers engaging in a bit more, be more cautious that you yourself are not importing issues or problems um, from another farm to your farm. Again, once there is the incident of a high level of insect pests on a particular plant, the plant normally is triggered um, by distress and as a result of this one of the hormones that the plant normally produces as a response to this trigger of stress is one that we refer to as um, ethylene or um, abscisic acid now once the levels of these two um, hormones or acids increases within the plant what you'll find happening is that the plant chips into a survival mode and as a result of that, it prioritizes itself, the main structure. And as a result of that, you start to see flowers um, and fruits being aborted in an attempt to survive. So when you see, for example, sometimes a farmer might realize that a sweet pepper, a hot pepper plant, even the same plant, one side of the plant is performing reasonably well compared to the other that nothing is happening. That is the part that you need to pay close attention to in terms of inspection for um, insect pests because once that happens, then you will tend to see that component or that side of the plant that is more stressed um, exhibiting signs of leaf fall in extreme cases, flower fall, and also fruit abortion. So. That is something that um, attention must be paid to. As it relates to diseases, fungal, bacterial, and viral diseases all play, play, critical, play a critical role in um, flower and food fall as well. So if you have a fungal disease, and sometimes even before it becomes um, visible to the naked eye, and there is 
that sort of infestation or infection that starts to happen on the tissues of the, 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 the flower and the fruit, and as a result, they become non-functional. They cannot carry out their normal processes, and as a result, that will lead to them falling from the, the, the plant. Bacterial infections normally interrupts whilst they, you'll have visual signs on the external tissues like your leaves. Um, the main problem, one of the main concerns is that they actually block or interrupt the transport of nutrients. So what they do, they block the tissues within the plant that transport water and nutrients to the areas that they are required. This again triggers a defense response from the plant. And part of the natural response that is triggered is that you'll have those immature fruits and flowers falling from um, the plant. So it is very important to understand what are the, the, what the crop that you're growing, what are the fungal and bacterial issues that are most likely to affect these um, this crop and also to determine whether or not the condition or the environmental conditions are conducive to their proliferation, to their existence and development. And as a result, the necessary proactive steps must be taken to ensure that you don't have a situation where you're responding, being reactive to an incident that is already causing um, serious um, impact to your overall yield. Again, the insects that we mentioned earlier, one of the major concerns um, with insect pests is not just the fact that they, they chew, they suck, um, they pierce the plant, but the fact that oftentimes most of those insect pests that are of major concern to us, they're actually vectors transmitting viruses. So even in the event of us exercising good control over the pest population, you'll realize that something is left behind. Um, and days later, you're starting to see, for example, the mosaicing of the leaves, which is characterized by different shades of yellow and green instead of the normal nice green tone to the leaves. Um, in addition to that, you might see the twisting or the curling of the leaves, the deformities um, of leaves, of fruits, of flowers as well. And this is all because of the viral load that is now present within the system of the plant. And again, pretty much like what our bacteria, the impact of our bacteria is that the viral infections normally interrupts the flow of nutrients and water to the parts of the plant that they're required. And as a result, all of those metabolic processes within the plants are now interrupted. The plant cannot survive. It is no longer healthy. And as a part of that natural response, again, what the plant tends to do um, in a quest to survive is that it leads to um, the abortion of fruits and flowers before they're mature. Again, all of these combined have serious implications for your outcome in terms of yields. And if it is that you're affecting yields, it therefore means that your revenue stream or your revenue, expected revenue, will also be impacted. So attention must be paid to these factors in a proactive manner. And oftentimes what we see happening out here is that we wait until there is um, a lot of damage done. We're seeing things and then responding. The reality is that oftentimes when you start to see the effects of some of these pests and diseases, you are behind the eight ball, long gone the damage and the, the investment, the effort to recover becomes a steeper gradient. And it is therefore important that from the get-go, um, farmers understand on a crop-by-crop -crop basis what it is that you're dealing with, what are the likely challenges, and the necessary steps are taken from the get-go to ensure that you're adequately and, armed and prepared to right. deal with this. 
All right, so Melvin, also important is uh, how the plants are fed, so that nutrient management program is also critical. Want to touch on that quickly ahead of the break, and then and when we come back, we just uh, put those solutions in or uh, emphasize them so our farmers can better understand what to do. Okay, so again, crop nutrition is, is critical to the overall health and well-being of the plants and the healthy plant will always produce because it is healthy it has what is required in the required volumes so again a balanced nutrition program not just a nutrition program a balanced nutrition program is always critical so it's not about getting all of those 13 um, 16 essential elements that the plant requires but ensuring that they're in a balanced form so I'll say off the bat that I'm not a good baker. I may I can list all the ingredients that might be required to give you a good food cake. But of critical importance is how do you then put quantities of that list together to ensure that you have the best result in terms of your outcome. And it's the same principle that applies to crop nutrition. It's not just about grabbing a bag of fertilizer. It's about understanding what is present within the the zone that you're producing your soil if it is that you're producing in the soil what is required by the plant and ensuring or taking steps to ensure that as best as possible you're providing a combination of those nutrients in a way that will facilitate the plant being as healthy as it should and with that said that is why our flagship here at newport first and is precise nutrient management because it not only reduces your in more often than not your cost of production but it eliminates waste and also gives the plant the opportunity give you the chance as a farmer to maximize your yields oftentimes the application of a lot of nutrients um, are unjustifiable because the soil test results sometimes is yield that you yourself could actually be selling some of those reserves of nutrients that you have. So it makes it um, unjustifiable for you to be heading to the farm store to get a nutrient that already is at very high levels within their soil. And as a result of that, part and part of us trying to fix that problem is to do the soil test because excess or too little of a particular nutrient has that implication on fruit and flower fall in our crops as well. All right. Thank you so very much, Melvin. We take the break when we come back. We're wrapping up our conversation with you because I'm certain that you have some guidelines that you just want to leave with the farmers. Miss Betty, early blight, take over my tomato. I will be full of powder and mildew. What am I going to do? Clear away. Oh, you are telling me if it's clear away. What do you think me are your friend? <laughs> No mass Kelso, may I tell you for use Clearway from Newport First and Jamaica. It is a conduct and systemic fungicide with protective and curative actions against a wide range of fungal diseases such as anthracnose and early blight in tomato, purple blotch in onion, late blight in potato, leaf spot in peanut, powdery mildew in pepper, and much more. <laughs> Thanks, Miss Betty. You're really my friend. Me are coming Newport First and Rep right now. Can't forget that name there. Clearway. Clearway. Farmers, get your supply today. Another premium product from Newport for San Jamaica Limited. All right, so, so we're rounding out our conversation with uh, Melvin Henry. He's been talking about fruit and flower abortion. And Melvin, before we jump back to some of those guidelines, there is a question here for you. It says, good morning, Miss Mack. Please ask your guests what cultural practices could one have employed to mitigate stink bugs in, bugs in callaloo, tomatoes, okra, and other vegetables after you have sculpted and identified them on your crops? Okay, so in, in terms of um, cultural practices, uh, it is one of those um, practices that we do and recommend from time to time to plant what we refer to as companion crops. Um, stink bugs are naturally um, afraid of uh, some varieties of 
flowers. So, for example, the the marigold that is normally used to give that bright, radiant color to the front of some gardens. Um, some persons refer to it as thinking pretty, um, naturally because of the odor that it emits. It's normally one of those practices that is done um, to some extent and to a large degree, depending on, again, the, the production size or the size of the plot. But this, this is one of those evaluations, for example, that we did um, back in the days at KISS, and we found out that in terms of that particular pest, that the, 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 press, the pressure from that pest was reduced significantly um, also, in a lot of cases, re reducing the need for you to intervene um, with a chemical alternative. So that is one of the cultural practices that um, has been used to great effect as it relates to that pest in particular. All right. Thanks, Melvin. That being said, are there any additional approaches or strategies that Newport First Sand routinely pursues or encourages farmers to pursue to tackle the prevalence of the issues that you have identified? Sure. As, as, as a routine at Newport First and our development and designs in terms of what we provide our farmers with are reflective of our criteria where we are, of the challenges that are associated with whichever production system or crop being produced by our farmers. Um, on a daily basis, great care is taken in to ensure that we observe and document a lot of challenges um, where they are present, at what time they are normally um, a real issue. And in addition to having the conversation with our farmers, we are in a position at all times to ensure that we be as proactive as we can. So as it relates to the guides that are produced for and provided for pest and disease management, it reflects the likely challenges. So if you're dealing with a particular crop, um, there's great care taken by us in designing your, your program to ensure that the likely culprits that would impact your fruit and flower fall are addressed in terms of an integrated pest management approach. So we detail what steps should be taken. And then there's also that chart which deal with, deal with the use of chemical interventions if necessary, and also the rotation of those chemistries to ensure. So it is not just something that you'll have to pluck um, from the head. It's something that we hand to you on a document, giving you the rotation, giving you the dosage um, for use. As it relates to the whole aspect of nutrient management, which is without question the core of our operation here at Newport First and Again, we continue to advocate for the top tier approach, which is having the soil analyzed and having your nutrient management program designed to reflect what is required um, and reflective of what is missing. Just yesterday, for example, I did a nutrient management program for one of our one of the top um, performers in papaya within the island, if not the top. Um, I and despite working with him for several years out here, he was planting in a new area and he understood that it was necessary to have an assessment of what the soil profile was. And lo and behold, when we did the sample, yesterday I designed for him a new blend. This blend was never designed in the island and probably never anywhere because of the combination of nutrients that he'll be using on this plot. And I'm here to say that in his design, there is absolutely no phosphorus included, which is normally the second number in the ratio on the back. It must also be stated that phosphorus is by far the most expensive ingredient in a fertilizer blend. So had it not been that it was another case where he didn't do the soil analysis and he was just sticking to a practice which is pretty much within the next three years four years will be 100 years old, most of those ratios um, that we're accustomed to, that traditional practice. He would have been spending money without need. 
And the sad thing about it is that with a high phosphorus level in the soil and you're applying additional phosphorus, what it does is that it prevents the uptake of a very important nutrient for food and flower retention, and that is zinc. And most of our soils, and the last time I checked, 68% of our soils um, from our database are, are deficient in zinc. So what it meant is that he would have applied more phosphorus without any justification, increases cost of production, and also impairs his productivity. So his yield would be less than it should be. So that's wow. so how it all it all So um, that's our highest level in terms of recommendations to approach crop nutrition. All right, and just 30 seconds then for you to tell us if you have any activities of note coming up. Um, so within that 30 seconds, of course, we close out the month of May um, with our friends at RADA, St. Elizabeth, um, St. Best Agrofest at the SDC Complex on Friday of this week. Um, so just closing out um, the activities for this month um, with them there. Um, we'll be there um, to be um, engaged by our farmers. And as usual, it's normally a very educational um, event where farmers can leave um, taking another step on the ladder to ensure um, great levels of productivity um, across the island. So that's pretty much it um, from my side in terms of um, announcement for this morning out here. All right. Thank you so very much, Belvin. Comprehensive as usual. And I'm certain that the farmers do appreciate all that you you do there at Newport for Sand for them. Thank you so very much. And just before we go out here, it would be a, a, a commission of sin if I fail to remember or mention uh, Westmoreland also, rather Westmoreland will be having their open day, um, which is a, a similar thing to what will be happening in Santa Cruz on Friday. So theirs will be on the 2nd of June. So we're inviting farmers in and around Westmoreland to come out and participate and join the RADA team as they do what they do consistently, which is to provide guides to our farmers. All right. Thanks much. Melvin Henry, their technical manager, Newport First and Jamaica. A quick word from them and then we're wrapping the show. First and in the field, real issues, real solutions was brought to you by Newport First and Jamaica Limited, the first on the land.